Okay, welcome back, everyone. We're ready for more fun and entertainment for our next session. We're on to session four. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our um, moderator and chair of this session, Av Posner, who is a, a graduate from the um, master's and PhD program. Um, and Av has also served on many boards for the architecture school and a, a great friend of the school. So thank you, Av, and take it away. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Am I in the right spot? Um, in, in thinking about Richard um, and, this, uh, and the topic of this session, I, I wanted to mention another aspect of Richard's involvement uh, with his students over the years, which, um, uh, which I think many of us have uh, experienced, which has been his consistent kindness, generosity, and encouragement. Uh, for all of our all of his students, um, in my case, he encouraged me to do the master 's program part time and even to bring my children to class when possible. <laughs> I think my daughter was in the fourth grade when she first met Professor Wilson after class, and altogether, there were fifteen years from my first meeting with the star of america 's castle castles to his considerate yet challenging direction of my dissertation. And when I think of Professor Wilson's scholarship, like all of you, I think of the absolutely extraordinary depth and breadth. My favorite story about this was the time my daughter, who by then was in college, calling me excitedly to tell me that in her history of alcohol spirits class, <laughs> Professor Wilson was the expert talking head in a video she was shown on the history of beer. <laughs> True story. I looked it up. She had seen the episode Brewed in America from the series Empires of Industry from 1997. How many other professors have their own IMDB page? <laughs> in my 15 years in the program, I met many engaged and well-spoken classmates. But the three women I have the pleasure of introducing, all former classmates of mine, are exceptional. First... My friend Elizabeth. Uh, it's, it's an inside joke. Um, I never actually say Elizabeth. I only say my friend Elizabeth. Um, not only is she a fabulous house guest, <laughs> but she is also a licensed architect. She earned her master's and PhD here in, in the uh, master's in 04 and the PhD in 2009. And her research focuses on New Deal architecture, particularly America's first public housing programs. She currently serves as the historic architect for the National Capital Area of the Park Service. Please welcome my friend, Elizabeth. Now, Dick told me to fix this, and I said, no, I don't need to. It'll be fine. Give me just a second. There we go. Okay. Dancing people here in a second? Yeah, I like them. They're great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think with that familiar opening. On January 9th, 1994, America's Castles debuted on the Arts and Entertainment Network. For five seasons, the show explored famous and not so famous... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go. I knew I was... There we go. Okay. Um, <laughs> famous and not so famous historic sites, um, mostly in the United States. And for five seasons and continuing for more than a decade in reruns, Richard Guy Wilson served as our guide, weaving these sites into their place and time. America's castles informed many with no knowledge of architecture, caused them to think about the relationships between buildings, power, and culture, and showed people how architectural historians see the world. 
This presentation will first provide a context for the show, to explore Richard's role in it, to examine the impact of the show, and to place America's castles in Richard's academic career. It can prove challenging to assess the value of public history efforts, such as a TV show within an academic career. But my discussions with Richard on the topic were never complex or fraught. Sharing a love for buildings, drawing people into the stories of buildings, their people and their histories, is what Richard does. The warmth and joy that we have all seen in his written works, his undergrad surveys, his grad seminars, these are the same qualities that serve the show well, that compelled thousands of viewers for so many years, that led so many to a new appreciation for America's built environment, a worthy goal in the classroom or the living room. All right, to, uh, to take us back to the 90s. reminder of what the 90s were like. <laughs> Let's hope it works. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> now back to our regular schedule program. There we go. Um, TV in 1994. As appropriate, let's start with some context. What was TV in 1994? The top-rated shows that year were Seinfeld, ER, Home Improvement, Grace Under Fire, and uh, Monday Night Football. I forgot that we ever had that many sitcoms. Um, other shows that debuted in 1994 um, were Inside the Actors Studio, ER, Friends, The Magic School Bus, Sister, Sister, and My So Called Life. <laughs> Um, cable television had been a force in America, med American media for more than a decade at that point, but it was growing and shifting, driving changes in the industry in 1994. Cable began to serve as rural areas in the, er in the years after World War II. In 1972, HBO began broadcasting the first pay programs to, um, to rural dwellers around Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And between 1977 and 1982, ESPN, BET, MTV, all these, channels foc uh, all these channels started that were focusing on certain audiences or interests. Um, and they had a mix of original programming and reruns. In 1984, arts and entertainment went on the air, initially serving as nighttime arts programming coming on the air after Nickelodeon, um, which shut down at 8 because children are go to, go to bed. Uh, the next year, A&E got its own slot. And at that point, uh, 41.5 million households had cable in the United States, which is nearly 50% of American homes. Envisioned as a cable version of PBS, A&E's signature show was the long-running show uh, biography, but they also broadcast symphony concerts, various murder mysteries, reruns of old TV shows, and the like. In 1994, it launched America's Castles and also Mysteries of the Bible and Ancient Mysteries, and the latter two forecast A&E's uh, gradual evolution away from the highbrow PBS model into more reality programming. In, at 19, in 1994, America's Castles joined a small group of programs that address buildings and our built environment. The particularly architectural atmosphere of the British drama Upstairs Downstairs, which aired from 1971 until 1975, was remembered, but was missing from the airwaves. PBS did occasional specials on some of the most significant American estates. This old house had already been on the air for 15 years in 1994, focusing on remodeling, but also appreciating mostly middle class older homes and the handicraft involved in their creation and maintenance. In 1995, Robin Leach ended 11 years of sort of reveling in the luxury afforded by wealth on lifestyles of the rich and famous. Cinetel Production, based in Knoxville, Tennessee, sensed a gap in the market, a place for a program that seriously addressed historic buildings and our built environment, a program that offered the vicarious delight of opulence while also bringing intellectual rigor to the effort, connecting those remarkable places to their particular moments in time. They approached Richard about serving as an advisor for such a show. The format for America's Castles was pretty flexible, but each episode was structured around a theme. Generally, the show began with a discussion of that theme, led by narrator Joe Van Ripper. Ripper? Sorry. Um, Richard also, also usually chimed in, offering an intellectual anchor for the episode. He and the rest of the production team developed the themes pretty creatively, and Richard felt these themes got better and more intellectually engaging as the series went on, which allowed the show to make meaningful connections between buildings. Some episodes were united by location, like Gold Coast Mansions of Long Island or the Windy City. They also centered on episodes, they also centered episodes by building type, offering an episode on various governor's mansions and another on artists' homes. Many episodes were unified by the owner's profession, the miners, the newspaper moguls, the coal barons, uh, 
and these allow the show to tie wealth and power into their architectural output, uh, into their and their architectural output output into particularly powerful ways, often mapping the birth, crest, and decline of certain industries through the homes of their masters. Outlining the, building, outlining the buildings and estates created by the Astors, the Vanderbilts, the Roosevelts found commonalities in the dynasties of the Gilded Age. There was one episode about Frank Lloyd Wright's three houses, but beyond that, the producers were reluctant to develop themes around an architect. Two years into production, they aired The Victorians, an episode featuring the Mark Twain house, the Glessner house, and the Thomas Edison house. And this episode was particularly fruitful, I think, uh, thematically. Uh, this title may have, may have seemed a bit surprising, as these houses are clearly not all stylistically Victorian in the general understanding of that capacious word. But their builders were men of the Victorian industrial age, determined, ambitious, creative, world-shaping men. By using the word Victorian to describe them in their homes, it swept aside unfashionable no notions of tasseled chairs or overstuffed couches and identified the deeper meanings in the term Victorian, the energy and innovation that drove the Industrial Revolution. Uh, then the show would turn to an examination of typically three historic sites, but that could vary. Um, Hearst Castle, the Mexican White House, and the Biltmore are amongst the building complexes that reasonably merited a full episode. Uh, the program would then essentially go on a tour of these buildings with a diverse group of talking head experts leading the way. Historians, architects, curators, museum directors, docents, residents, former residents, former servants, descendants of the builders, descendants of the enslaved uh, workers, um, and once memorably a psychic counselor. All, they all told their stories about the site. The backbone of basic facts was fleshed out by this diverse group, and their different visions and memories built a larger, complex narrative of the place. All right, and I have a pop quiz. America's castles featured two presidents. Two actual presidents were experts. Does anybody, can anybody tell me which two they were? Two. No, 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 actual experts spoke. Five people. <laughs> Governor's Mansion. <laughs> oh, well, okay. <laughs> Seems like a sad way for us all to go out. I'm sorry, Richard. <laughs> Anyway, um, in, the virtual tour of e in the virtual tour through each house, the program examined not only the architecture, but also the landscape and the furnishings, educating viewers on what composed the personality of these homes. With particular attention to the owners, the show often examined the relationship of the residents to their architects and how that impacted the design. This focus on the clients also allowed the show to address the contributions of women in these complexes, from Hillstead to Hillwood. Richard reviewed the careful scripts for each episode, ensuring accuracy, particularly in the narrator's portions. No one was improvising. His sections were often filmed at the Knoxville studio, occasionally at the UVA studios, and sometimes on site. And he'd typically film a few episodes at a time. Over the course of watching 61 episodes of this show, I witnessed a cavalcade of decorative arts objects, salvaged ceilings from French palaces, Belgian tapestries, crystal chandeliers, double high Tiffany stained glass windows. I can finally identify Ormolu. Uh, but the small innovations that were created for owners' needs are particularly delightful. Sarah Winchester's seance room, her entire house really, speaks to our particularly American relationship with our homes, our desires to form them around our thoughts, desires, and occasionally our fears. I'm particularly taken with these built-in scales at the Salisbury House in Des Moines um, and with uh, John Hay Hammond's reigning atrium um, up there in the corner occasionally. So you're sitting in the dining room and he had this big atrium and he could make it rain in there and occasionally he would do it uh, while people were eating just to sort of throw them off, which <laughs> is really a good time. On first glance... <laughs> 
On first glance, America's castles might be merely categorized as an examination of Gilded Age mansions of the coasts, with heavy emphasis on the industrial revolution-fueled too-muchness of the early 20th century Robert Barron elite, something of a historical lifestyle of the rich and famous. Uh, the great mansions of the era are certainly covered, but, an analysis, illus anal but analysis illustrates the show dove much deeper than that and did so from its first season, examining houses from across the country and from the full timeline of our history. As a caveat, I think there are three episodes I wasn't able to see. Um, Grand Resorts 2, uh, Roosevelt Estates, and the Rocky Mountain Homes. Um, so this analysis is necessarily a bit incomplete. But from what I've seen, the show covered just under 200 buildings in 41 of the 50 states. I based the release dates on the Internet Movie Database, which we've now quoted twice in this session, which I think means we're going to win. <laughs> Um, and the other episodes list vary, the other episode lists varied a bit, but IMDb uh, seemed the most accurate. Um, so you can see from the beginning, they spread out to all corners of the United States. They didn't turn to Kalispell, Montana, just because they'd already done all the really good places. Rather, from its beginning, the show examined historic places throughout the United States, places that are nationally, regionally, and locally prominent. In its first season, America's Castles visited houses in Iowa, Montana, Maine, Georgia, and Utah. Over the course of the series, they also vid visited Puerto Rico, Canada, Mexico, Scotland, England, and Monaco, discussing the connections these houses had to particularly American stories. Rather than limited to the half century on either side of 1900, the show ventured earlier and a bit later. Portions of Longwood Gardens from the 1730s are the earliest American buildings treated in the series. Earlier buildings included on that timeline are, are European. Um, there aren't big gaps in time. A regular watcher of the show could gain a fairly good understanding of how and why American residential architecture changed over time, from before the Revolution up to the World War II period. The show never ventured beyond the houses of the richest of the richest, however, understanding luxury of wealth as integral to the appeal of the, a commercial television show. If the casual channel flipper only stopped for stuff like Ormolu, however, why would they hold up at Mount Vernon? Sorry, Lydia. Um, it takes some interpretation to understand the wealth embodied by that Palladian window. Could they have been equally engaged in a discussion of post-war curtain wall skyscraper construction? Um, I, I think that there was a lost potential that I know Mr. Wilson felt as well. Entitled America's Castles, the show focused on houses, and Richard chafed a bit under that yoke. In the second season, they visited three grand resorts, a uh, home's away from home, really, uh, Mackinac Island's Grand Hotel, Hotel Del Coronado, and the fabulous Mission Inn in Riverside, California. They did a second Grand Resorts episode, and then they began pushing on the formula at the behest of Richard, I imagine, who kept bringing them interesting themes and great-looking buildings to talk about. They did an episode on movie palaces and one on cathedrals that, in a stroke of subversive genius, ended at the Neuter Johnson Crystal Cathedral. Um, as Johnson's portion of that complex was built in 1980, it was also the most recent building covered in the show. While this focus on residential construction may have been a bit limiting, as with all rules, it also provided a certain structure. As we know, many books have been written on why the vaunted American dream is so tied up in architectural ambition, why houses are so important to us as Americans. America's Castles, with its nearly 200 case studies on that particular question, is in many ways a multi-year examination of the topic, offering nearly 200 different answers to that question. Americans clearly love houses, but you may not have realized that from watching television in 1994. Cinetel Productions and Richard were helming one of just a handful of programs on the topic. America's Castles premiered in January 1994, and in December of that same year, Cinetel, under the leadership of owner, owner Kenneth Lowe, launched HGTV, originally called the Home Lawn and Garden Channel, and part of the Scripps Network Interactive. This channel has continued to grow, focusing on shows about home buying and renovation. In 2016, they spent $400 million on original programming, and they now reach 94 million homes in more than 16 countries. HTV is the most prominent purveyor of home shows, but hardly the only one, as TLC and even MTV has offered their own approaches to the question of homes. Although America's Castles had a different approach to buildings, its DNA is deeply embedded in what is now a major media industry. To put it mildly, running historic sites is a difficult task. Typically, a small staff is responsible for safeguarding tremendous treasures while also serving as a community center. House museums are repositories for collective memory. They are evidence of the history and character of a place. They serve an intangible but essential role in a community. Limited funds make it difficult to provide uh, the best interpretation to, pr to protect invaluable buildings, landscapes, and collections items. 
Pressure to accommodate and excite visitors can often put resources at risk. The museum industry is constantly rethinking and predicting the death of the Historic House Museum. But yet they survive, often by the skin of their teeth. There is only one Biltmore, a well-diversified commercial juggernaut. Many small cities and towns have a site like the Marland Estate in Ponca City, Oklahoma, which hosts the prom, the Oktoberfest, the Dragon Grand Auto Show in June, and innumerable weddings, and had an administrative coordinator with a flair for the fabulous. <laughs> She's wearing a boa. Like, it's a, I think it's a boa. It's really great. Um, she was going to be on TV, and she looks great. Uh, working in historic house museums can feel exhausting and taxing, and the vast majority of the sites included in America's castles are house museums. Six of the 20 National Trust historic sites were included in the show. Six were national park sites, um, some w the, and these have a network of outside support. Uh, many, many others are small, independent museums. America's Castles gave these historic sites a national stage. It gave their hardworking, underpaid staff recognition. Many could not have afforded the high-quality video that the show shot. Gift shops sold the VHS copies of their episodes for years, providing another modest revenue stream. America's Castles endorsed the house museum model and made these small, hopeful institutions valuable in the eyes of their immediate neighbors and American viewers more broadly. When I started architecture school in 1995, I told an engineering student at a bar that I wanted to be an architectural historian. And the guy seemed really confused and told me that if you like buildings, you just want to make new ones, right? Um, so that's where the popular understanding of our profession sometimes is. Um, but for 11 years, we had an architect architectural historian on TV. People knew it was a thing. I have an accountant cousin who can't tell the difference between the Corinthian and the corn cob order, but he knows who Richard Wilson is. And at Christmas one year, he really wanted to talk about the Biltmore Stone Staircase. Um, to quote from a 1996 letter from a 23-year-old fan, I must say, I love your bow ties. <laughs> I see you every weekend talking about these great homes and the people who lived in them and built their great empires, and I swear I hang on every word you say. I don't want to build the homes, and I don't want to decorate them. I want so very much to study them. I have a feeling you know where I'm coming from. Many of you undoubtedly have similar stories, and some of them were just shared. America's Castles gave the profession of architectural history popular recognition. It excited people about our inbuilt environment and made them look around more carefully. In its Catholic tendencies, its outreach, its spirit of collaboration, and its love of beauty, America's Castles fits comfortably next to Richard's published works. In his evaluation of McKim, Mead, and White, and in his in-depth questions about the colonial revival, he took critically and popularly unconsidered buildings and wove them into the larger historical narrative. Similarly, I can imagine the delight Richard took in proposing visits to museums in Billings, Oshkosh, and Ponca City. America's Castles was a large collaborative effort that drew strength from multiple, vision, multiple voices it provided, similar to many of the books Richard had written with other authors. In his exhibits and books that, that accompanied exhibits, Richard sought to expand the audience, to draw museum goers into the field of architectural history, to create connections between decorative art, art, architecture, and landscape. America's Castles brought that same spirit into the living room of most Americans. In addition, the show took a visceral delight in the building, the landscape, and the physical objects within each building. They were beautifully filmed, and it is obvious that it would be important for the audience, but, it, but is also a tendency I see in Wilson's exhibit books like The Machine Age. To conclude, America's Castles was a television show, necessarily bound by the limits of the medium. But those 64 episodes, which occupied space on the American airwaves and the American consciousness for more than a decade, offered an expansive notion of where American history has happened and when it has happened. It showed how buildings are connected to their place in history and how history drives the design of buildings. The show buoyed up the institution of the Historic House Museum. America's Castles was a collective endeavor, but in guiding the themes, collaborating on the scripts, and most significantly, in sharing his obvious enthusiasm for the built environment, Richard shaped the program and gave an authoritative, enthusiastic face to the field of architectural history and academia at large. Thank you. Elizabeth, that was terrific. Thank you. Um, next is Dr. Amy Finstein, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Visual Arts at the College of the Holy Cross, where she teaches modern architectural and urban history. Her research focuses on how the desire to be modern has inspired diverse designs, ranging from high-style modern residences 
to Art Deco elevated highways. She recently served as consulting historian to Boston's Rose Kennedy Greenway to develop an augmented reality e exhibition within the Greenway parks and is a contributing ed author to the recently released Atlas of Boston History, University of Chicago Press. Amy will publish her first full book next fall with Temple University Press and has published previously in the Journal of Planning History, Preservation Education and Research, and ARIS, Journal of the Southeast Chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians. She completed her BA in American Studies at Brandeis University and her MA and PhD in Architectural History here at the University of Virginia. Amy Finstein. Thank you, Ab, and thank you all for being here and for the opportunity to speak to you this morning slash almost afternoon. October 17, 1986, marked the opening of a new exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum entitled The Machine Age in America, 1918 to 1941, co-curated by our very own Richard Guy Wilson and Diane Pilgrim, curator of decorative arts at the Brooklyn Museum. This exhibit featured 350 different objects, ranging from prints, photographs, and models, to cocktail sets, furniture, cars, planes, and radios. Wilson and Pilgrim used this range of objects to support their contention that the interwar years cultivated a uniquely American design sensibility that celebrated the era of the machine in objects big and small. Widely praised by both the popular and academic presses, this exhibit also yielded an accompanying book, and together the exhibit and book reoriented academic and popular discourses to acknowledge and celebrate the varied iterations of machine-inspired design from the interwar period. This paper will revisit the machine age in America, establishing the scope and message of the exhibit and accompanying book, and will showcase how these ideas have been key in the development of my own scholarship. First, a primer about the Machine Aid show. The exhibit was the second collaboration between Richard Guy Wilson and Diane Pilgrim. They first had worked together on a 1979 exhibition also at the Brooklyn Museum, The American Renaissance, 1876 to 1917. Building on Wilson's own scholarship about McKim, Mead, and White, the American Renaissance show and its accompanying book argued that America's neoclassical enthusiasm of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, to quote one reviewer, quote, reflected the nation's coming of age as a coherent civilization, end quote. The machine age in America, with a chronological purview immediately following that of the American Renaissance, documented the potency of machines as new literal and visual points of national reference between the end of World War I and America's entry into World War II. Wilson and Pilgrim showcased this trend through two major types of works. First, they assembled the everyday machines and machined objects that had forever changed daily life, including telephones, radios, refrigerators, furniture, jewelry, and household accoutrements. These wares, which were eminently accessible and ubiquitous in interwar America, implicated everyday citizens in the consumption of new artistic forms and invited that same public to consider the design intention of these objects. The exhibit's second genre focused on works by painters, photographers, and sculptors that responded to this new machine culture. Wilson and Pilgrim sorted these two types of works into five major categories that allowed them to juxtapose far-flung examples. For example, the category of the vertical city presented the pervasiveness of skyscrapers as a visual point of reference for designers by featuring woodcuts, furniture, and sculpture that all echoed aspects of iconic step-back skyscraper forms. The machine purity section interpreted the machine quite literally, featuring machines themselves, photographs of machines, machine-inspired sculptures, and architectural models that showcase different interpretations of machine-inspired design. Items fitting this bill included an aluminum propeller and a model of Howe and Lascaz's PSF, 
PSFS building, excuse me, of 1930. This section also addressed the impact of European modernism on American art and architecture and the role of two now famous exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art in sharing ideas with the American public. The exhibit section on streamlining welcomed into the fold of art history the accomplishments of industrial designers who quaffed smooth, rounded forms for everything from vehicles to pencil sharpeners, maximizing their theoretical aerodynamic qualities, whether functionally required or not. The exhibit boldly announced this methodology to visitors via the feature of a full-size 1935 Chrysler Airflow automobile in the museum's entrance lobby. Other mechanized forms of transportation loomed large just beyond the lobby, including photographs of Henry Dreyfus's 1938 New York Central 20th Century Limited locomotives and Raymond Lowy's 1939 S1 locomotive for the Pennsylvania Railroad, and the stunning sight of a 1929 Davis D1W parasol wing monoplane suspended from the museum ceiling, something that wowed visitors and reviewers alike. A somewhat unexpected aspect of the exhibit's approach was the category called biomorphic, which Wilson and Pilgrim used to categorize objects that used fluid, nature-inspired forms to contrast with the machine world, while simultaneously being machine-produced themselves. This included Raymond Lowy's iconic 1933 pencil sharpener at left, as well as Russell Wright's ubiquitous American modern dinnerware. One reviewer particularly lauded the exhibit's clear categories of organization, noting that, quote, not only, uh, excuse me, quoting that it not only gives order to an otherwise chaotic array of visually arresting images and artifacts, it also reinforces the exhibit's central theme of coherence, end quote. Thanks to this coherence, the Machine Age exhibit broke attendance records at the Brooklyn Museum and then embarked on a three-city tour to Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, and Atlanta in 1987 and 88. New York Times art critic John Russell lauded the exhibit as one of three shows that he described as chapters, quote, in the unpublished biography of autobiography of America. Citing the first two installments as the National Gallery of Art's 1976 show entitled The Eye of Jefferson, and second, Wilson and Pilgrim's 1979 American Renaissance show, Russell went on to position the machine age as essential in understanding America's psychological and aesthetic transformations during the interwar period. Other reviewers echoed this enthusiasm, celebrating the show's breadth and inclusion of objects that never had been exhibited before. One commentator noted that, quote, the ex exhibition succeeds in transcending the bounds of the purely art historical and proceeded to praise the slide presentation and accompanying written materials that empowered exhibit attendees to process the context and methodology of the exhibit material in a readable and complementary manner. An accompanying book, more than a simple exhibi exhibition catalog, brought this material to an even wider audience. Authored by curators Wilson and Pilgrim with the added voice of art historian Dikrin Tashian, The Machine Age in America, 1918 to 1941, presented its topic in nine thematic chapters, six authored by Richard Guy Wilson, followed by one each by the other authors and a jointly written conclusion. After an introductory chapter by Wilson that established the book's guiding argument and scope, Wilson's other chapters unpacked specific typologies within this framework. Chapter two on machine aesthetics defined the distinct stylistic categories that Wilson and Pilgrim used to organize the exhibition. And chapter three, selling the machine age, outlined the importance of annual model years and product obsolescence as key to the cycles of design and consumption that ingratiated machine forms into the lives and homes of Americans. Wilson's fourth chapter, The Machine in the Landscape, focused on the infrastructure projects like dams, highways, tunnels, and bridges that both benefited from and edified the power of the machine as it reframed how landscapes looked and how humans interacted with them. Chapter five, Transportation Machine Design, echoed the dramatic inclusion of the car and plane in the exhibition by profiling vehicle designs for road, rail, and sea, and the broader importance and impact of industrial designers in this realm. 
In Chapter 6, Architecture in the Machine Age, Wilson engaged the exhibition's aesthetic categories to show how the same societal and mechanical stimuli had yielded buildings of widely varying appearances. The chapter's concluding section, entitled Toward an American Machine Architecture, positioned gas stations and factory buildings alongside Bucky Fuller's Dymaxion Home, the Keck Brothers' Crystal House, and works by Wright, Neutra, and Schindler as evidence of, quote, architects who attempted to go beyond style and create a totally machine architecture, end quote. Following Wilson's chapters, Tastian traced the growing presence of the machine through an art historical lens, and Pilgrim detailed how industrial design of household and decorative arts objects brought the machine sensibility to a consumer public. In sum, the book expanded on the ideas and typologies showcased at the Brooklyn Museum, adding more visual examples and factual evidence to create a volume of incredible depth and breadth. One reviewer quipped that, quote, it is difficult to imagine a more solid, more complete synthesis, and went on to warn that the book's robust image program ran the risk of making the exhibit itself seem, quote, visually impoverished by comparison. In 2001, some 15 years after the initial exhibition and book release, Harry N. Abrams reissued the book, a testament to the importance and endurance of this facet of Richard Guy Wilson's scholarship. One major guiding question raised by the machine age informs my own scholarship, and that is, how did modern ideas about architecture in the age of mechanization become legible to the public? The machine age in America traced this at the level of consumer products, individual buildings, and works of art. But I wanted to know if anything in the urban realm announced this change in a larger scale way, writ large on the city itself. I developed the answer via my dissertation under Richard's direction, which studied elevated highways of the 1920s and 1930s that were inserted into the existing fabric of American cities. These highways uniquely merge local concerns about urban growth and transportation with broader dialogues about architectural and urban modernity. Bisecting buildings, straddling streets, or sometimes creating entirely new ground planes, the physical superstructures of these roads became major aesthetic arbiters in the urban landscape. The book version of this research, entitled Modern Mobility Aloft, Elevated Highways, Architecture, and Urban Change in Pre-Interstate America, will be published next fall by Temple University Press. The book uses three specific examples to illustrate this larger pattern, and you see them on the screen here. Chicago's Wacker Drive, New York's West Side Elevated Highway, and Boston's Elevated Central Artery. These three roads share four major criteria. First, the highways were inserted into existing urban fabric in the years predating widespread automobility. Second, their constructed nature meant that the highways had tremendous visual and experiential impacts on their cities. Third, all three highways used architectonic decoration to celebrate and mediate their urban presence, although the styles of decoration differed substantially from one another. Finally, each project received late 20th century reconsideration. Chicago extended and restored Wacker Drive to maintain its role as a key downtown route. The West Side Elevated Highway suffered structural failure in 1973 and was superseded by an on-grade street in 2001. And Boston removed and replaced its elevated central artery with a new subterranean highway network topped by public parks via its infamous Big Dig, which reached completion in 2007. Since these roads significantly affected subsequent development patterns, both locally and nationally, understanding the sequence of their design evolutions helps to explain our current urban landscapes. Two of my major questions focused on establishing the origin of the concept of an elevated highway in each case, and second, quantifying the role of architects in conceptualizing the highway's literal features. I found that in all three cases, the conceptual ideas for elevated highways originated with local business advocacy and municipal planning groups who saw street congestion as a threat to the economic and experiential health of their cities. 
In Chicago in 1907, a business advocacy group called the Commercial Club was so concerned about these issues that they hired architects Daniel Burnham and Edward Bennett to develop a master plan for the city, what would ultimately become the famed 1909 Plan of Chicago, from which Wacker Drive later was excerpted and realized in the 1920s. At the same time, the concept of skyward transportation aligned with technologically empowered visions of urban form, then frequenting the pages of popular and architectural publications alike. A city's adoption of such a scheme placed them firmly in the fold of the most current and avant-garde architectural discourse. The architectural vocabulary of elevated highways varied widely in my three cases, with the Beaux-Arts take in Chicago, Art Deco elaboration in New York, and raw engineered simplicity in Boston. I found that this variety developed from the involvement of specific architects whose cities hired to plan the physical impact of road superstructures in their urban fabric. For example, in New York City, local shipping concerns about Manhattan's west side spurred proposals of horizontally striated transportation options as early as 1904. But the full iteration of the west side elevated highway did not materialize until a local municipal leader began to champion the project and subsequently retained an architectural firm to design a sculptural program to define its physical presence in local streets. The firm selected for this work, Sloan and Robertson, was a Manhattan architecture office then designing many iconic Art Deco skyscrapers in the city. For the highway, they worked with the architectural sculptor René Paul Chambelin to develop a program of cast iron cartouches, granite card carved guardrails at entrance ramps, stepped light stanchions, and railing details that echoed aspects of larger machine-inspired artistic vocabularies. In fact, in a perfect full circle connection back to Richard Guy Wilson's work, the Machine Age in America exhibition featured in its front lobby a pair of decorative entrance gates that Chambelin had designed for the executive suite entrance inside Manhattan's Channon Building, an Art Deco skyscraper designed also by Sloan and Robertson. As suggested by this crossover, machine-inspired design came to define objects large and small, and in the case of urban elevated highways, played a major role in mitigating and celebrating the public's interaction with functional changes in the urban streetscape. My new research project focuses on a different facet of questioning about how the public came to interact with modern design, what I would call the consumptive side. The subject of my research is this building, the Virgil Abeley House in Framingham, Massachusetts. For those of you familiar with the work of Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer in America, you may recognize that the angled entrance canopy, white rectilinear massing, and large field stone wall of this building bear uncanny resemblance to other commissions completed by Gropius and Breuer during their brief partnership, notably including their own homes, which they used for teaching and marketing purposes. This imitative stance made me initially question the authorship of this building, discounting it as the work of an architectural admirer. However, once I began to research the house, I uncovered that the patron, Dr. Virgil Abeley, met Marcel Breuer at the 1939 New York World's Fair, and at Breuer's request came to visit the Breuer and Gropius houses in Lincoln soon thereafter. When Abley engaged the pair to design a new home for him, he specifically requested the replication of key elements from each architect's own homes as parts of the finished design for his. I think that this imitative stance is important from two perspectives. First, it invites us to reconsider how architectural imitation might be viewed, perhaps cringeworthy at first, but upon closer examination, representative of a more nuanced story about the particular commission. Second, the aspect of replicating modern architectural forms, I venture, is a representative of a larger ethos of architectural consumerism in the 1940s and 50s that operated at both the scale of the patron and the architect. From a scholarly perspective, this sequence interests me because of the literal design involved and also because it demonstrates how the larger American public began to interact with and consume avant-garde ideas about modern architectural style and suburban living. 
This, from my vantage point, is one of the most important legacies of the machine age in America that was okay and, dare I say, encouraged to treat modern engineered and mass-produced objects as worthy of study, documentation, and inquiry, and to invite them into the fold of art and architectural history overall. Richard Guy Wilson led that, led that charge with the machine age in America using the pairing of an exhibit, exhibit and book to reach local and diffuse audiences alike. Richard has used his scholarship, teaching, mentoring, and advocacy work to share his topical and pedagogical knowledge with so many students, scholars, and the public at large. And we are all the better off for having seen the world machined and non through his perceptive lens. Thank you. Was wonderful. Thank you. Um, our, our last presenter is Lydia Matisse Brandt, who earned her MA in Architectural History here at the School of Architecture in 2006, and her PhD here in Art and Architectural History in 2011. She is currently an associate professor at the University of South Carolina, where she teaches the history of architecture, American art, and the theories and methods of historic preservation. The University of Virginia Press published her first book, first in the homes of his countrymen, George Washington's Mount Vernon and the American Imagination in 2016. She is currently working on a guidebook to the South Carolina State House grounds to be published by the University of South Carolina Press next year, and history of the Southern Colonial Revival, or the Plantation Revival, with Philip Mills Harrington, who is an assistant professor of history at JMU. She is also the co-editor of Buildings and Landscapes, the Journal of the Vehicular Vernacular, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, vernacular, sorry. The Journal of the Vernacular Architectural Forum. Please welcome Lydia Brandt. All right, now for something <laughs> sappy and sassy, which I think is how one of, one of the things Richard and I share, we, we're both of those things, and we also like dogs, and Tom, Tom, little Tom Petty was really wanted to meet y'all. Um, <laughs> some years ago, deep in the weeds of writing my dissertation here at UVA and my first scholarly article, I found myself sitting with two of Richard's books, written 20 years apart. I was trying to synthesize my own explanation of how the colonial revival began and naturally his 1983 McKim Meadham White monograph and his recently, then recently published 2004 colonial revival house book were places to start. I found that while his two accounts didn't contradict each other, they didn't always agree either. The earlier cataloged and described while the latter was more confident, generous, and nuanced. Now, after seven years of picking apart scholars' arguments in graduate school, this should have been no great epiphany. Over the course of a career, research builds on itself. Of course we will find that previous conclusions were misguided, incomplete, or even wrong. But as students, we usually focus on one argument, one article, one monograph at a time. I had never thought about a scholar's work comprehensively before. To see this in action from someone I thought I knew quite well was a revelation. Could Richard ever have been wrong? <laughs> so I asked him about it. What happens when you realize that you were misguided in an earlier publication? Is it scary to have to fix something? His response was typical, assuring, a little irreverent, and served with a smile. That's why you publish a lot. This, this advice has guided my work <laughs> ever since. Do the work, get it out, and don't stop looking, asking questions, and getting the work out again. Richard's work also provides, as we've seen in both of the previous talks, an example for collaboration as a way to generate new, revised, or just more scholarship. 
An approach that I've realized after eight years as a professor is brave, uncommon, and not usually rewarded or even encouraged by the academy. Putting this talk together has been a wonderful opportunity for me to review Richard's career. The paths of ideas, movements, buildings, and architects that have woven through his books, exhibitions, catalogs, television specials, public talks, field schools, advocacy, and articles. His CV is online, and it's really, really amazing and entertaining somehow. His, I don't know how a CV ends up entertaining, but Richard can nail that. Um, his truly prolific and public-facing production has offered so many opportunities for revision, reorganization, and the introduction of new research to that first imagined decades earlier. To return to topics he was not quite finished with, had never fully explored, or that he completely rediscovered. Today I will not claim to summarize Richard's career, nor will I pretend to talk for all of his students or all of you. Instead, I would like to organize some of my own loosey-goosey observations on the trajectories of Richard Guy Wilson's scholarship, his impact on American architectural history, and his influence on some of us in this room. Following in the Wilson vein, and I swear we did not collaborate on, our two on his biographical presentation and mine, completely separate. Um, I'll begin with a little biography. And as with all biography, intersections of time and place are essential to understanding someone's production, as we all learned in this room. Richard's childhood home destined him to be an architecture fall. Built in Rudolf Schindler's final and most dynamic phase, the Guy C. Wilson house was the perfect womb for a baby architectural historian. <laughs> Many of us have had the great fortune to eat in these low, I do not think they're uncomfortable, <laughs> chairs um, designed for Richard's childhood breakfast table. And when Charles Jenks died recently, I had the opportunity to tell people the story that once sitting in these chairs, he told me I was very short. Well, that's obvious, but I'm shorter in these chairs than usual. But Richard's beginnings were at least a little windy. After some time in the Navy, including some very formative exploration of Newport and a lot of reading, he came to the University of Michigan to earn his Master's of Library Science. Thankfully, and in a way that surely mirrors many of our experiences in Richard's classes, Leonard Eaton's architectural history courses led him back to architecture and to his pioneering dissertation on McKinley and White. Richard entered the academic field of American architecture at just the right moment. Pioneers like Henry Russell Hitchcock had already given credi credibility to American architects, including them in his pantheon, while Fisk Kimball and his ilk had lovingly appreciated and preserved, sometimes too lovingly, its material. By the time Richard came along, St. Vincent Scully was imagining American landscapes in the same breaths as the Parthenon, while William Geordie was articulating the contributions of American modernists alongside the Bauhaus geniuses. Ram Stern, Robert Venturi, and Denise Scott Brown argued for architects to return to historic precedents for complexity, context, and contradiction. And Ada Louise Huxtable was commenting on all of it, taking lazy architects to task and recognizing the American public as an intelligent audience. The distinct field of American architectural history was legitimized and made newly purposeful, but its goals, heroes, and monuments still needed to be discerned, discerned, defined, and organized. There was plenty of work for a young Professor Wilson to do. Richard came to the University of Virginia in 1976, the same year as the Queen of England. These <laughs> incidents are not related. Architectural history was ascendant at UVA in the mid-70s. So were sideburns. Campbell Hall was the new home for the School of Architecture. Les was beginning to be bore in its studios. Architectural history degrees had recently been established, and the newly renovated rotunda still smelled like paint. I've never asked Richard. But it strikes me as at least a little ironic that the same university that had hired him had just destroyed an interior by the architects at the center of his research. 
Regardless, the timing and setting was perfect for a scholar who believed firmly in the importance of teaching architectural history to architects, as well as in, an, in a distinct American architecture. Over the next decade, Richard was key to the school's establishment of the PhD program in architectural history, without which many of us wouldn't be here today. Finally ensconced in his first architecture school, Richard was also immersed in a landscape that would become central to his scholarship, the lawn and world of Jefferson. He told me recently that when he reported to William Jordy that he had uh, taken a job at UVA, Jordy predicted that he'd become a Jefferson guy. Richard scoffed, but in his recent words, they do getcha. The leap from McKim to Jefferson isn't all that surprising in hindsight. Both were doing their own kind of cut and pasting with classical architecture. In Virginia, Richard found himself at ground zero for America's constant refashioning of historic architecture that would become so central to his career. Richard's scholarship flourished on such a fertile plain, and its breadth, as we've discussed, in the decades that followed is truly astounding. I came to know Richard in my first year at UVA by having the great fortune of working as his research assistant, which consisted in those days of filing his slides. I did a lot of this. Uh, I would put the Allman Brothers on my headphones and head over to the A school around 9 at night, unlock Richard's office door, flip on the lights, and dive into a plastic lunch basket full of slides. I realize now that this activity taught me more than just how to read impossible handwriting, Although, my students thank you, Richard, for pre providing truly a superlative example. <laughs> the sheer range of images demonstrated to me that all buildings deserve consideration. Whether or not you have heard of the architect or the city in which it sits. Sometimes, what we are told is architecture is wrong. Such terms can limit us from seeing the truly marvelous. Buildings and cities can surprise you if you're open to what they have to say and are willing to put your ear to the whispers of a corner or an edge. And sometimes they're funny. <laughs> Thankfully, the Fine Arts Library worked with Richard to digitize more than 8,000 of these slides. Although I couldn't find a rest stop, I was really disappointed. I always liked the rest stops and contribute them to the Society of Architectural Historians Architecture Visual Resource Network. And I counted, there are no less than 136 chairs. <laughs> what I observed refiling Richard's slides, image by image, is plain in all products of his scholarship. He loves buildings, all buildings, but it's about depth as much as this encyclopedic breadth. Each building has its own personality, each chair, has its own personality, and it's his job as their ambassador, therapist, and translator to help them speak. According to my, I take very good notes, according to my notes from Richard's 19th century architecture lectures, Carson Peary Scott oozes sex over the doorway, <laughs> while Lindhurst grumbles gloom in all capitals. <laughs> Each building has its own quirks and attitudes just waiting to be described with appropriately purple prose, and each has its own tale complete with plot twists fit for a soap opera or an A&E special. Richard makes architects and clients into complex heroes and villains in these stories, each with their own motivations, families, and bad habits. Looking through my notes from his lectures, I found that Frank Furness wore big plaids, <laughs> Sullivan was a perennial romantic, William Strickland, poor thing, suffered from the American classicist complex, A.J. Downing was a propagandist, and Wright was terribly scandalous. But Richard doesn't reduce these people to characters. He also lets them speak for themselves through lengthy quotations and the handouts that I now know I was not the only person to save. Um, he encourages you to look and read, to immerse yourself in the words by and about the people who made buildings. 
But Richard also says that, quote, it's what we invest in buildings that give them meaning, giving considerable roles to us, the audience, in building stories. How people make and remake architecture, how we sell it to each other, how we interpret it, want it, hate it, love it, preserve it, destroy it. All of that matters just as much as the choices of a client or designer. In Richard's hands, American architecture is an endless deck of cards. Without the hierarchical trappings of traditional suits, buildings are shuffled, paired, and played against one another, one another to tell different stories. His scholarship sparkles at these intersections. Between art, technology, and craft, medium and materials, society, politics, and culture, past and present, and most importantly, between the dance of America's insecurities, braggadocio, and optimism. Richard has generously allowed us to play at the table with him. We have leapt into the game at different times over the course of his career, playing a hand or two, perhaps pocketing a card, I asked many of you for stories of specific buildings that Richard brought into your lives, and you buoyed me for today's task and revealed some clear patterns. Richard's words have brought many of us to look twice at a single building we couldn't otherwise have cared a fig about. Andrew Marshall first uncovered Richard's scholarship via his very lively description of the very boring Richmond City Hall which recently got a, uh, a, a little facelift, which is why I'm showing you this kind of bad picture. Andrew found Richard's entry um, in his uh, Buildings of Virginia book, Funny and Efficient, he said. And I'll quote here, Richard. The sheathing is now secured by a semi-permanent system of nylon straps, which serve as band-aids for a larger problem. <laughs> Indeed. In other cases, Richard has encouraged us to notice something new that then inspired us to see the built world completely differently. His attention to furnace, and especially his interest in the interiors and interior designers ignored by many architectural historians, helped to inspire Paula Moore's fascination with high Victorian Gothic. After visiting Hill House long before taking Richard's Arts and Crafts Seminar, Christina O'Malley finally realized the richness of what she had seen. Richard pushed her to think beyond the single mythical genius to the web of collaborative partnerships that created such a total work of art. In Richard's classes, field schools, and through the experience of reading his scholarship, our eyes are trained to look at entire environments and to ask specific questions of why something looks the way it does. For Bridget Malley, this skill helped her to sp spot Carl, John Carl Warnicke's modern additions to Julia Morgan's Asilomar Dining Hall, as she talked about yesterday. In many cases, Richard has introduced us to a... Y'all are like better than church. You are such a responsive argument. <laughs> Our audience... In many cases, Richard has introduced us to a single building that has led to rich, lifelong scholarship and, and obsessions. He introduced the Gothenaeum, I hope I said that right, to David McKinney in a 1988 seminar, leading David to continue research on Rudolf Steiner and to publish on the building. Jeff Tillman first encountered the melting pot of revivals, that is, Bakewell and Brown's work, in Richard's lectures. After asking him about the firm, Richard provided him with a four-inch thick file with contact information for Brown's family and his own research on multiple buildings. This generosity uh, was, the, was the seed of Jeff's dissertation, book, and his fruitful career. Richard has introduced many of us to buildings that have become quite personal, when Sally Butler first saw the Berkeley Memorial Chapel on the Newport Field School, she could never have imagined that she would soon live and work nearby, or that Wilson's broad view of an infectious fascination with all things Newport, as she put it, would become a model for her own teaching and scholarship. Sarah Dreller and Clark Christensen met during their Masters of Architectural History program and discovered this building while sitting next to each other in Richard's class, maybe in this room. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> I just love that. 
See, there's the sap. Okay. Um, after school, they lived within six blocks of this church and decided to get married in it. I love that. And as we heard about yesterday, love has also blossomed on the summer among the summer uh, field school students. So Richard has inspired true love between humans, not just between humans and buildings. And that <laughs> is just the sweetest. Richard's example and direct encouragement has also helped some of us to ignore the haters, to pursue something that scholarship explicitly declares is unworthy of study, time, or attention. Uh, and I think that's a big theme of, of Amy's talk. After researching in uh, Paul J. Pelz's archives at the Library of Congress as part of an independent study with Richard, Victor Dupi was told by another senior academic, bad, that this topic was not worth it and he should pivot to architecture. Victor later realized he'd been steered away from the work he truly loved and returned to the field for a PhD in architectural history. Well done. <laughs> the credibility that Richard has found in the colonial revival has kept me going for the better part of two decades and counting. As long as I live, I will always find more of these. Thanks, Richard. Uh, even when professors, editors, and colleagues have told me directly to my face that this topic is silly, distasteful, or just too popular. <laughs> His work to meet the colonial revival on its own terms, to understand it as an attitude rather than a style, and to take its varied motivation seriously has shaped my career. Most importantly, it's taught me to respect buildings and the people that make and use them. Richard doesn't just see buildings, their personalities, their stories, their makers, their users. He communicates how to see, what to see, and who to see in buildings. He has helped, to find, helped us to find beauty in the mundane and humor in the unexpected. And he thinks we are all capable of close, careful, thoughtful looking. The success of his holistic, <laughs> respectful, generous approach is clear. We have all been shaped by it. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Um, pretty amazing. Um, questions? There's, a, there's one in the in the back. Uh, there's one in the back. Should we put the lights on? Right, there we go. Okay. All right, guys, get ready. <laughs> okay, I have a question for Lydia. What's the best Minnie Mount Vernon you've ever seen? In, it's in That's a it's tough in, question, but you got to have an opinion. It's in Chautauqua, New York. <laughs> I love a Mount Vernon funeral home. They're my faves. <laughs> but they're kind of normal, like you see them everywhere. I found a good one in Arkansas recently. Um, but my favorite Mount Vernon is um, at the American Village, which was built in the early 1990s and continues to be added to just south of Birmingham, Alabama, and Montevallo. And it is uh, a, intended to be a stage for uh, imagining ways in which individuals have had a major impact on American history and American politics. And I went down there to visit and ended up spending an entire day driving around with the founder and the architect in a golf cart. And it was a million degrees. And it was amazing. And they're continuing to build replicas of other buildings. They just finished a carpenter's hall, which I haven't seen yet. Um, but it's pretty fabulous. And they actually, they didn't do the, they didn't do the piazza, uh, the um, Potomac piazza. They did a plant, like random plantation like the columned thing. It looks like 12 oaks stuck to the front, which is just makes it even better 
to me that they didn't think that Washington's piazza was good enough. So it wasn't Southern enough, so they had to put up one with the pediment. I'm like, yes, you, you made a good choice. Other question? Did, on, on this side? Elizabeth, hang on to the microphone, please. This is for you. So how did you watch all of the America Castle shows? <laughs> YouTube. Slowly That's what carefully. I was going to say, yes. because that's super interesting, right? That mm -hmm. you can get them on YouTube, and it was the ones that you couldn't get just weren't there? They and just do you... weren't there. Okay. Yeah. And because it's, you know, I have a 13-year-old who's watching all these 80s rerun sitcoms on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just thinking about now this new longevity of America's Castles, do you want to comment on that at all? Well, and it, one of the charming things about it is that clearly somebody, somebody somehow digitized actual VHS tapes. So there's like the play button in the top and it gets kind of blurry. And sometimes they don't. And actually also on YouTube in the same searchable area is commercials of America's Castles and also commercials that were played during America's Castles, which are the best. Um, they are the best. So, um, no, but I think it's really interesting. You know, the, you can get them on DVD. Um, you can order some of them, some of the, you know, the Bill Moores, the Newport Mansions, the big ones you can, you can buy on DVD. But almost all of them are available on YouTube. It's pretty great. Yeah. Anyone else? Going once. <laughs> uh, there's one. Uh, Christine? Christine? Um, I just wanted to add a little bit of personal history to round out Amy's excellent um, sort of description of the cultural impact of the machine age in America. And I don't know how many of you remember this, but Diane Pilgrim joined Willard Scott to broadcast the weather on the Today Show, standing oh, cool. next to the car in the oh, lobby oh. of the uh, Brooklyn Museum. And we all watched it at home on TV. <laughs> That's, <so cool. laughs> That's great. That is really great. Any other questions? No? Uh, and with that, um, well, the, uh, one, the person who named, yes. who got the president, I do have a prize, so please come claim it. Right, right. Uh, one last round of applause for our three presenters.